writer for The Guardian, The Atlantic, and The New Statesman? Uh, uh, good, uh, Chris is kind of a board game guy. Like, that was not really a very good job that to really describe my work. So, Quinn is a board game guy, everybody. Oh, does that mean I'm a board game guy? Okay! So, uh, Lee and I uh, met at Game City last year, so uh, we thought what could be more appropriate uh, for a talk at Game City this year than a talk about relationships uh, and also sex. Again with the Ooh. sex thing, getting right to the point. That's funny, everybody. Because games are terrible at both. Uh, indescribably, inexplicably By terrible. By both you mean sex and relationships. And relationships, So it's yes. possible to be terrible at both. Uh, yes, I yep. think so. Okay. Uh, so this was kind of appropriate as well because of how you started in the games industry, isn't it? Um, yeah, actually. Um, we met in person for the first time at Game City last year. Um, prior to that, we knew each other online because we, back in, what, 2006, 2007, um, Quinn's and I both had columns at a website called Game Set Watch. Uh, mine was about sort of what I would have defined at the time as, I called the column the aberrant gamer, and it was about sort of a deviant thought and behavior in sex, or what you would quote unquote call deviant, um, including sexuality, and uh, unfamiliar psychological concepts. Um, yours was about the <laughs> Mine was about games that you should play that people aren't playing, and it was called Battle Claxon because I was 22. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, at the time, I, I battle claxed on games that you should play that you aren't playing. It was important. So original. People weren't Very playing good. Those games. Very good. Mine was about grown up stuff. Um, <laughs> I began gravitating toward games that, to me, they seemed to need translation, not literally, but that they would be hard to understand from someone on the outside looking in, why someone would want to play them. Should we see a picture of one of these adult games? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I began gravitating toward uh, a lot of opaque Japanese visual novels about melodrama, sexual aggression, kink. Uh, and mermaids we can see here. Yeah, there was this game called, no, there, there were games about appetizing fantasies that it wasn't mainstream or socially acceptable to express. And in one of my favorite games, you could um, have sex with a mermaid that lived at the bottom of the well. And if you could see her animating on the screen, she's showing all four uh, emotions for women that you are going to have sex with. Because um, there are four in games. That's happiness, that's... That's forlornness of the sex. That, that was just, <laughs> she looks yeah, yeah. progressively more disappointed. Okay that's that's so yeah, I was. Uh, I, I I had sex with with the mermaid. Uh, I have to admit, I was actually kind of pretty into it. Um, this game again was called Nocturnal Illusions, and it had various supernatural women living in a haunted mansion. Um, there was obviously so you play this some guy, and of course, makes total sense. There's obviously no way that you could solve the mystery of this mansion without having sex with every single woman that lives in the mansion. And it was, yeah, almost prohibitively game-like. Like, let's say you're walking around looking for a woman to have sex with. She wouldn't appear, um, of course, you know, you're playing as a man and the only choices are, are women. And, um, she, and so your potential sex partner would not appear until you had visited every room and selected to look at and think about basically everything there was in the house. You had to basically fulfill the entire game world's examination quotients before the story would progress. So basically you couldn't have sex until you finished walking around, looking at and thinking about every piece of furniture. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> so I also wrote about Princess Maker, um, we have a slide of this, um, which is a parenting sim. You adopt a little daughter that falls from a star, and as your father, you have to stat manage her upbringing until her 18th birthday, at which point she gets married, and the quality of the husband she gets and the career she gets depends on how well you've done and what kind of careers you've applied your child to. Did it turn you on? Uh, she's a little girl. Um, <laughs> you can put her to work, and work in a brothel, or you can alter her bus size with pills. Um, the highest ranking win condition for Princess Maker 2 is that she marries you, her father. <laughs> Players even made an undress patch for Princess Maker 2 so that you could ogle your naked daughter who you wanted to marry. So that was 1993. Uh, by, 19 <laughs> by 1999, things had got a lot more advanced. Yeah, they were like movies. <laughs> 
recently Lee dragged me kicking and screaming through a playthrough of this. So this is Tender Love and Care. 1989. Part of the uh, FMV driven game movement. Sadly no longer with us. No more FMV games. Uh, and this, this, is, this is kind of amazing. You play a kind of voyeur ghost travelling through a house. The, uh, the sort of no, you're not literally a ghost, you're just an incorporeal rando. Which makes a lot more sense, yes. yeah. Uh, the guy you, uh, you see in the blue suit there, uh, him and his wife have just lost their kid. Hot. His wife is traumatized. Hot! The, uh, the blonde lady is their living nurse who has some very unorthodox uh, methods for unorthodox helping them deal with their grief. Um, so, did it turn you on? It, it almost did. Really? And then every time it got close, fucking John Hurt would show up. <laughs> See what he saw? <laughs> John Hurt would stride onto the screen too. Yeah, every t at the end of every chapter, yeah. John Hurt would show up, also incorporeal. The only person who could see you or be aware of your presence it was and John Hurt. Yeah, you could walk around the house and never be acknowledged by everybody, but every, every so often, John Hurt needed to know your opinion. <laughs> and he would provide his own opinion and uh, sort of keep things on, for, away from becoming pornography. And also, you very close attention to what he had to say because the game would ask you questions uh, after this. About what you'd observe. And so, you know, you're paying close attention to these guys' psychological profiles and you're taking it as seriously as, it, as you want, as it wants you to take it. And then the questions are stuff like this. Oh, the questions are great. Wait. Oh. Well, uh, okay. There you go. So Men who perform out. oral sex on a woman are. And you, can, can you read the choices, Quince? Uh, we've got weak-minded, uh, uh, giving, sexy, stupid, or smart. Yeah, so Which, it, and it gets better than this, though. Yeah, yeah really. my favourite option sequence that you were asked for the game is this. During lock play, which phrase is the most exciting? I love you. You're, you're beautiful. Do me. I'm going to die. <laughs> and you drive me crazy. Okay. Which one did you pick, by the way? Uh, the obvious. Who doesn't think I'm going to die? I have to think I'm going to die. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's easy to make fun of Tender Loving Care, but it kind of... I don't know, I like to think it puts someone like David Cage in perspective, because this is a game where you're, you're given a lens through which to look at three people who the designers really tried to make seem almost real. And you're, you can read their psychological case notes on their computer. And you're learning actually about three tormented adults' relationships to grief and how sexuality is expressed in times of trauma. Which is a bit more, I think, as silly as this game is, thematically it's a bit more complicated than... What is Beyond Two Souls about? Beyond Two Souls is about... What do you think David Cage thinks when he wants to? You know, I haven't played this game, so yeah, David Cage thinks about... Ghosts. Running through trains. Yes. Very symbolic. Um, yeah, most of the FMV games from the 90s I can remember tried to be um, very adult and sophisticated by borrowing film at conventions, and many of them um, combined sex with mental health problems. Like, they were trying... <laughs> it sounds funny, but like they were going from a mature treatment of adult psychology um, alongside sexuality, like those were the most adult themes they could think of, um, to try to grow video games right up and make them like movies. Um, did, it, did anyone play the Fa Phantasmagoria games? Yeah. Yeah, so in the first Phantasmagoria game, your husband is possessed by the ghost of a gruesome carnival magician. Um, the game included a rape scene, because that's really adult. That's how, yeah, um, edgy. And then in the second Phantasmagoria, you play a man struggling with mental health problems. And actually, he's even coping with his gender expression and his sexuality, which we don't really see commercial games offer us. You know, we don't see men doing that in commercial games today. Um, interestingly enough,